Uh, so this is part of a larger project uh, that I'm leading at the University of Erfurt called The Other Global Germany, Deviant Globalization and International Crime in the 20th Century, in which we're trying to look at ways in which uh, different forms of illicit trade, uh, different forms of mobility over borders considered to be deviant shaped processes of globalization, and also Germany's response to uh, different forms of international interconnection and their proliferation from the late 19th century up until the present. So for my own part, made a transition from looking at human rights and international law into mostly international crime. And it was part of a habilitation project where I'm looking at the emergence of international arms and drugs control regimes and international arms and drug smuggling as part of globalization in connection with Germany. Now, so as a framing for this, in recent uh, months, Germany has come under fire on internationally for the idea that it is far too restrictive in terms of its arms exports to the Ukraine, and that it is excessively cautious when it comes to transfer of weaponry. And this is a certain irony to this in that for the last 130 years or so, Germany has mostly been criticized by the international community for being a country that is a proliferator of the small arms trade, and one that has done far too little to prevent the illicit trade in arms leaking out from even its um, regular uh, legal forms of international arms sales. And so at the moment, Germany is the fourth largest, or sorry, fifth largest international exporter of arms. And you can see on the map on the left in 2011, Germany sells guns to practically every country on the planet. Uh, and so it's really a major player in modern times. It's only behind the United States, Russia, uh, France, that we can talk about, um, or sorry, and with China. It's really the only, um, it's one sort of the top countries in the world for the proliferation of small arms, military goods. And in, the past decade, there's been a huge amount of domestic political controversy over countries that Germany is arming, which use those weapons for the conduct of warfare and domestic repression. And this is something that goes back over 100 years in terms of controversy about Germany's place in the arms trade. Uh, so in the late 19th century, we saw a huge explosion in the global trade of small arms. This really came from a huge amount of technological development in Europe at the time. You have an upgrade in the kind of technology being used for military rifles. And as a result, every major military had huge surpluses of outdated firearms. So what happened was a massive secondary market was generated where obsolete, outdated weaponry was being sold on from Europe to the colonial periphery. And this creates a large number of conflicts as European powers are essentially trying to offload old weapons in the colonial hinterland of their rivals, while at the same time trying to prevent their colonial rivals from doing the same. But every country has a huge motivation to do this in that it's incredibly profitable, and the profit from the sales of obsolete armaments can go towards modernization at a time of increased European military competition and the, uh, the beginnings of what becomes the arms race leading up to World War I. Uh, so when we look at this time, the main markets for these weapons uh, in terms of small arms trade is a space of colonial conflict and resistance in Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia. And this really coincides with Germany's efforts to expand its global reach as the era of Weltpolitik and the ambitions of the Kaiserreich to create a global colonial empire that could rival that of Britain and France. Um, so one of the things that we see in this time period is that major German arms firms are an important part of German foreign policy. So there's an effort to try and use German military production to dominate sales to various national militaries. We see this at the time, Qing China is a very important uh, country or state which is using German weapons to try and modernize. We also see this with the close relationship with the Ottoman Empire as well as Latin American countries like Brazil and Chile. And in terms of the creation of these relationships, there's an integration that we can see of diplomacy, the deployment of military advisors from the German military to these states to help them figure out how to actually work with these, 
You have private merchants who are involved in uh, the sale and transfer of weapons, as along with the actual arms manufacturers themselves, who are often part of a personal diplomatic relationship with people they're selling to. And you also have the involvement of different industrialists who are part of economic development programs. So most famously, Berlin to Baghdad Railway is tied up in the massive arms sales to the Ottoman Empire. Here we see uh, an Ottoman soldier on the top with a German uh, Gewehr 98 rifle and below a uh, Qing Chinese soldier with a C96 pistol made by Mauser. Both of these are going to co keep coming up for a while. But when we actually look at this question of what is an illicit arms sale at the time, this doesn't really exist as a category. There isn't any kind of international regulation on this, and there isn't really any kind of agreement on what kind of arms trade is allowable within the international community. Uh, and this really changes when you have the Abushiri revolt in East Africa in 1888-89. There's a revolt against the German East Africa Company. Uh, a coalition of Arab and Swahili speaking African communities led by Abu Shiri Ibn Salim al Hati. And he's pictured here with carrying a very old flintlock rifle. Um, and this is a rebellion that gets put down by German troops, as you can see on the left, with much more modern weapons. Um, but this leads to the German state trying to work with Britain to create some kind of preliminary arms prohibition regime. Uh, and so there's a joint blockade where Britain and Germany, along with France, and uh, work together to try and prevent European arms from entering into uh, the east coast of Africa. This, in turn, gets uh, moves on to become the basis for the 1890 Brussels Conference. This is officially a conference that's meant to be an extension of the anti-slavery efforts of the 19th century. But what it becomes is also the first international treaty trying to regulate both arms and intoxicants. So on this map, you can see in this area uh, in the east, there's a zone called the slave trade zone. This is a place where slaves were, this is a treaty agreed that no one would export slaves from this region. Having slavery in the region itself was still okay, which is what happened in the German territory. Um, and then also the line cutting through the Sahara down to uh, the very top of or the border between British South Africa and Bechuanaland Protectorate. This whole zone was one in which arms were not supposed to be imported along with alcohol. So this beginning of this sort of idea of interconnecting a regime of uh, control over what is moral forms of consumption uh, connected into this question of the movement of people and forced labor, as well as security issues of weapons. And this is a collection of questions of the regulation of different forms of transnational mobility that keep coming up in clusters over the years. But it creates a multilateral arms control system, which Germany, working with many other powers, is really at the forefront. But there's also a huge number of exceptions. One of the things they try to do is really limit modern weapons, but allow for the continued trade in obsolete ones. So to preserve the profits of the arms trade, um, here's a better image to really show the zone that was being governed at the time. Uh, basically creating a spatial regime of control in which this is a space in which only the oldest type of weapons could be sold, but modern weapons were kept out so that everyone could maintain their level of profit from resale, but without threatening rule by making sure that European forces always had the most modern technology. Uh, and this multilateral effort also coincided with uh, an increase in bans on the arms trade within individual colonies that continues from 1890 up until 1914. So as you have increasing levels of discontent and rebellion, individual colonies begin to place greater restrictions within individual spaces on how the arms trade uh, can be conducted. Uh, and one of the things we see here, although Germany had been a pioneer in trying to push for some kind of international multilateral agreement on arms control, independent German entrepreneurial uh, merchants are really at the forefront of using illicit arms trade as a way to expand the zone of German colonial influence. And here, things like the Hamburg America line, um, if we look at the different sort of shipping agencies, that the expansion of steamship lines is tied up in the increasing effort by different merchants based in Germany or based abroad 
to try and find ambiguous spaces where they could carve out uh, sites of influence or profit at the margins of the British and French colonial empires. So in the Middle East, this is a really popular area for this in that a lot of the spaces weren't formally part of the British or French empire, or you had overlapping control. You had local rulers who were officially acting as uh, under the protection of a colonial power, but the exact terms of uh, control weren't always fully clear. So um, another thing at this time is companies like Mauser are really trying to expand their small arms sales, where instead of trying to say that they're expanding military sales, they basically create weapons that are of military use that can also be sold as um, things for civilians. So if we look at this um, ad at the top from H. Tauscher, who's an agent for German weapons in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. They're selling bolt action rifles that are practically the same as the military model, but as sporting rifles. You have Luger pistols, Mauser handguns, these are things that are designed to conform to sort of the idea of civilian weapons that would be useful for police, they would be useful for sportsmen, but if you give enough people these sort of guns are actually a pretty effective military force as well. In particular, I mentioned the C96 handgun that you can see here, where it suddenly becomes a rifle if you attach a wooden stock that comes with it, because the stock is also a holster they made for it. Um, if it looks familiar, it's also the model for Han Solo's blaster in Star Wars. So if you've seen that hand, broom handle before, that's where it comes from. Um, so at this time, you not only have merchants who are trying to expand, but this global market for guns, which is expanding. So manufacturers are trying to sort of push beyond just state sales and get into the sort of mass proliferation of individual firearms. Uh, so there's a number of hotspots that emerge out of this. One is Muscat, so modern day Oman. It's really a space of ambiguous colonial control between the UK and France. And it, given its geographic location, it's a perfect site for traffickers to go and meet up with local uh, traders who are involved in smuggling guns into Persia and then towards frontier level, rebels fighting against Britain. So this is sort of the nexus point where you have the meeting of European traders, often with Gujarati traders who are um, responsible for transporting guns from the Persian Gulf into Persia proper and then up to the Northwest frontier. There was a famous case of the steamship Baluchistan that was loaded up with weapons. It was a British ship, but it was also insured by a, a German corporation. And the Brits boarded it and um, sort of held it uh, under impound on the grounds that they had an arms embargo for Persia. But in this, at the time, basically Muscat becomes a place where uh, Europeans can try and drop as much product as possible into a territory that's as close as possible to Persia, but without actually having to go into it. Uh, and the Sultan of Oman is perfectly happy to have the increased trade and encourages this. And we see from at the time, the German Foreign Office actually starts to expand its diplomatic representation in the region following arms traders who are expanding what they're working on. So the German Foreign Office not having the capacity to send diplomats everywhere, but as soon as an entrepreneur was able to sort of open up shop in the region and seemed to be doing quite well, and as soon as they started to have diplomatic trouble, the foreign office would then send representatives to try to back them up. So in this case, we're sort of illicit traders, some of whom had actually come from East Africa because they'd been in the slave trade. And when that got shut down, they decided to move over to guns. We have a process where illicit traders by merchants are actually the leading edge of German imperialism and the foreign office is trailing behind as they show where the opportunities are. Another major case of the sort of expansion is Ethiopia. Initially, Germany had actually agreed to limit arms transfers to Ethiopia in order to assist uh, Italy, who had imperial ambitions there, except for the fact that with the Battle of Adwa, uh, Italy was defeated by the Ethiopian military. Um, also noting here that uh, in Ethiopian art, the fact that they did have modern weapons to fight the Italians is something of national pride. Um, and with Ethiopia being able to establish itself as an independent empire within Africa, Germany actually drops its domestic ban on exports and establishes uh, diplomatic relations and then also uh, arms trade in 1907. Uh, the problem with this, though, is that all the routes to get to Ethiopia as a landlocked country run through French Somaliland, which is today Djibouti, 
Um, and so we had a situation where essentially an independent country is, uh, or elites from within Ethiopia, as it was a, a feudal structure, so you had different militaries being built by different regional elites, they would try to contact Germany, German merchants and German firms to buy weapons, but all the routes to go through to, to Ethiopia were policed by the French who then tried to shut down this trade so that they could have their own influence in the region. So this situation where you have a sort of question of the, what is actually an illicit form of arms trade. In this case, it's one where um, individual colonial powers could essentially set the terms within corridors they controlled for trade. And Germany had to work around whatever they could on a geographical level as one of the latecomers to uh, the colonial, um, to gaining international colonial territory. And finally, look at Morocco. Uh, the Tangier crisis is usually remembered as one of the um, flashpoints leading up to World War I. But what's interesting about it also is that it's tied up in this question of arms control, that one of the points of contention at the time was that German merchants were selling arms to insurgents fighting against the French, Spanish, and local Moroccan authorities. And uh, that this is one of the things that the local authorities and the French and Spanish were trying to crack down upon. And that this sort of the defense of local German trade was something that the Kaiser uh, wanted to push back upon, along with the challenging of increased French influence in the region. Uh, so uh, with the Tangiers crisis, this leads to the Algeciras conference. Um, one of the sections within that is actually an update to the Brussels Convention of 1890. And Morocco is geographically absorbed into that sort of space within Africa I showed you earlier. This weird process where international arms control continues to be really based on spatial understandings of zones where uh, colonial powers deemed they have the right to determine what kind of trade can be happening, as opposed to any kind of universal principles. Uh, so in this case, well, German diplomacy in, in Muscat was usually fairly effective in protecting individual traders. The Kaiser actively going to Morocco and trying to create this into a crisis ends up actually leading to an increase in the prohibition zone and the formal system which uh, acts to the detriment of German traders in the area. So the efforts, this sort of problem of coordinating individual traders who are acting on the margins of legality, that the backing of the German state can sometimes really end up having the opposite effect because of the grandstanding of leaders. Uh, and we can see leading up into World War I, this real escalation of arms trading as a form of inter-imperial provocation that while previously people were selling arms into the colonial hinterland, by 1914, German traders out of Hamburg are arming both sides of the impending Irish Civil War. So one Hamburg, trainer, ben, uh, Hamburg trader, Benny Spiro, he's pictured here in the top left, the guy in the beard. Um, he provided Irish buyers uh, from the Ulster Volunteers with 25,000 Austrian rifles. And then a few months later in July, 1914, as World War I is breaking out, Moritz Magnus Jr., who also had a very large global network um, tied up in the Oman trade and strong ties with Mexico, he was able to provide 1,500 obsolete but functional 1871 Mauser rifles, which had last been used during the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, he was able to get these for Irish nationalists, which were brought in during what they called the House Gun Running Incident in July 1914. So in this way, that even before the, um, the conflict begins, you have German merchants who are willing to risk the wrath of the British Empire by sending guns right into its backyard. Now, with the Versailles Treaty in 1919, Germany is banned from domestic military arms production and export. It's no longer allowed to send military advisors abroad. Uh, and this leads to the increase in the number of restrictions on Germany leads to a great deal of creativity. Oh, sorry, did I lose the signal? Oh, there we go. Um, there's a great deal of creativity by merchants, producers who look for different kinds of technicalities uh, in order to avoid this new arms control regime, which is specifically imposed on Germany. So uh, in terms of what actually counts as a weapon of war and what counts as a German firm becomes an important question at the time. Um, and there's also a massive amount of surplus from World War I, which again fuels this international market. 
So one of the main flashpoints at this point becomes World War China. And um, this is an interesting case where Germany has lost its colony in uh, Kaohsiung. It no longer has any influence in the Shantung Peninsula formally. And the policy from Berlin towards China was that Germany would be a neutral power. It would be an honest broker in the region. And China's po its policy towards China would become a model for post-imperialism. And the representative from Ber uh, Berlin who was posted in Beijing was very adamant on the idea that Germany wouldn't take sides. So when Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang approached him in the early 1920s, asking for advisors, arms, and assistance, this was turned down. However, you still had a large number of German businessmen who were active in Shantung, and you had a large number of diplomats who were around who had active contacts with many of the different warlords. In some cases, these were people who were translators, they were low-level diplomats, and they become middlemen working together to bring in guns from Europe via German businessmen uh, into the region. And often these diplomats end up making astronomical sums for doing so. There's a huge amount of corruption that's happening here. Um, and again, this question of what is actually a military arm, as you can see in the bottom right, uh, Mauser keeps developing this sort of pistol, which can be used as a rifle. They find a way to make it into an automatic weapon. It's so effective, it actually ends up being used as an anti-aircraft gun on planes in the interwar period, where people just connect eight of them together uh, and just sort of try to pull a trigger, which is supposed to make them all fire simultaneously to make some kind of very strange uh, pistol-based machine gun. Um, and in the case of China, Britain leads, uh, Britain and the United States lead an effort to create an arms embargo to prevent guns from coming into the region, but Germany isn't actually invited to take part in this formally. Uh, but at the same time, as weapons from Germany are, and other areas are transiting to China, Britain makes a very large show of trying to interdict them, and Germany becomes enemy number one, according to the British, in terms of fueling the civil war in China. There's a picture here in the bottom left, um, a German ship that was stopped in Ceylon, and uh, it was seized, it was, as it says here, uh, a ship from Hamburg, and it was claimed that they had sort of old machinery parts, but they're actually uh, sort of guns that were, and rifles that were ready to be handed off to different warlord communities. Um, what's interesting at the time as well is that you have German merchants in China who periodically then try to call in the German government to assist them when they have shipments that are seized. While the German government then has to say, explain that they no longer have extraterritorial legal rights to interfere in internal Chinese affairs. So you have German merchants uh, and traders are often playing this game of acting as fully independent uh, actors who are able to create their own foreign policy as they go. And when they start getting into trouble, that's when they start invoking national interest. Uh, and this can really lead to problems for the German state, as in the case of the Falke, a very weird episode in 1929. There's a pair of Hamburg arms traders, Felix Kramarski and Felix Prenzlau, they get contacted by an exiled Venezuelan general, Carlos Delgado Chalbod, and he wants a ship full of guns so he can go launch a coup in Venezuela. So the two Felixes agree to this. They have a shipment of guns in Gdynia in Poland that was supposed to go to Afghanistan, but the king dies before he can uh, finalize the sale. So they send a ship crewed with a German crew um, of sailors and a group of small, or a small group of Venezuelan revolutionaries. They're supposed to go to the Caribbean, drop off the guns, and then come home. Unfortunately for the Hamburg merchants, the captain of the ship gets religion on the Venezuelan revolution and decides he is going to help end tyranny in the region. He decides that this ship will now become the first ship in the revolutionary fleet. And uh, half the crew objects to this, so they're basically held against their will on the ship as they take on a revolutionary fighting force who comes on board so they can launch this invasion. Um, and the ship lands in Venezuela, where informants from within uh, Chalbaud's group have told the government what's happening. They're immediately ambushed by government forces. Everyone is slaughtered, except for a small number of survivors who flee on the ship, including its captain. Uh, and then they are picked up by the British, who accuse them of piracy, because they're not really sure what else to accuse them of. And then the captain is eventually charged with kidnapping and attempted sort of uh, forcible confinement of the crew who refused to take part in the revolutionary uh, attack. Eventually, the captain's actually 
cleared of these charges because the Communist Party backs him as a sort of heroic figure against militaristic tyranny. And the courts basically decide that when you signed on as a sailor to a gun running operation to Venezuela, if it turns into a revolutionary coup, it's really your own damn fault for signing up in the first place. So the court decides everyone is not guilty. They can't figure out any charges for the two Felixes from Hamburg. And in the end, the whole thing goes away. But initially, it's a huge problem for the German government because a German ship has just declared war on Venezuela and they have to account for what's going on. Um, under the Nazis, we see this sort of reconsolidation and a re-coordination of the of international arms trade with state policy. The, these networks of arms dealers who have connections internationally are expropriated, mostly on the grounds that they're Jewish, but also on the grounds that Nazi loyalists are inserted into these trade networks so that they can become part of this profit machine. Um, so uh, at this time, you also have a shift from this sort of freelance entrepreneurial efforts by people and the arms rate is really shifted towards the um, priorities of the Nazi government. So in 1935, arms are actually sold to Ethiopia to defend themselves against Italy because Hitler was upset that Mussolini hadn't basically asked permission to do so. Uh, then 1936, a pipeline of guns running from Germany to Spain during the Civil War opens up, controlled by uh, Nazi-aligned middlemen. And at this time also, the trade in China had actually become sort of taken over by senior military officers who used that illicit pipeline in order to help with the remilitarization of Germany domestically. But this gets shut down by the Nazis in 1938 when they make a decisive change from trading with both China and Japan to just trading arms with Japan and cutting off ties with China at this time. So this process where in Weimar, you really had a disconnect between state and uh, these traders who are operating on the margins of legality. Under the Nazis, they tried to reconsolidate everything as part of a general Gleichschaltung. Uh, when moving to the Cold War period, initially, there's again this sort of period of free for all where merchants are trying to sort of connect to whatever conflict zones are going on, even if it's uh, there in places where uh, it's awkward for the German government. So the most famous case of this is during the Algerian War of Liberation. West German arms traffickers are incredibly active in bringing in guns, sometimes from uh, Eastern Bloc countries even. And so you have this strange situation where you have ex-SS officers who are now working as arms merchants who are there helping the revolution. Um, you had, at this time, you had ex-SS officers working on many sides of these conflicts, but this sort of had a faction of people looking uh, to exploit their contacts, as well as the lingering anti-French sentiment made the Algerian conflict appealing. And in, again, the conflict with France over arms trafficking, in this case, you have French intelligence-backed terrorist group, the Red Hand, which starts a campaign of assassination and bombing in West Germany, uh, targeting um, Al both Algerian buyers as well as German traffickers, one of whom was uh, sort of you have boats that are being uh, blown up in Hamburg and Bremen trying to target them and their shipping capacity, uh, something that's very awkward for the West German government to try to explain. Um, at the same time, East Germany in its quest to get hard currency, which is already a problem in the 1950s, they really start looking to basically any possible buyers. And early on, apartheid South Africa starts trying to make East Germany into its main source where they can get light weaponry. And there's a series of deals that are being negotiated over East Germany becoming one of the main suppliers of handguns to the apartheid South African government. And eventually this is put on ice uh, when the Soviet Union basically says we can't be involved in this. And so there's a process in the 50s where both Germanys are sort of moved over towards a Cold War logic in the arms trade. But in the initial phase of things, these private actors are basically looking at the margins and trying to find any places, any conflicts where the illicit trade will bring in a lot of money. Um, so the really defined thing is the... Uh, West German law passed in 1961 regulating uh, export of military weaponry. It's still a binding law, which continues to be affected by political statement or political terms, uh, which are redefined regularly. But the main concept is 
arms should only be exported to NATO countries, but also to friendly countries in which they won't be used for internal repression and won't contribute to ongoing conflicts. And these third countries are supposed to be approved on a very limited basis. But by the 1980s, this gets up to about 15 countries. It involves a number of countries in the Middle East and Asia, many of which are dictatorships looking for military weapons in order to maintain internal control. But the West German G3 rifle, which is created by Heckler & Koch, a company which is founded literally from the ashes of the Mauser Corporation, which had had um, French officers decide to burn all their records and loot the facilities. A handful of engineers from there decided to found Heckler & Koch in the same town and continue with this uh, sort of production of internationally exported arms. And so the G3 rifle becomes a competitor to the AK-47 for Western and NATO allied countries. The picture of Saudi troops carrying one. Uh, the Iranian military also has huge quantities left over, which are still used today, even though the gun is sort of deemed to be kind of obsolete. Um, in East Germany, uh, the main uh, source or main export market were liberation movements and emerging colonial states in Africa. But when you look at uh, armed resistance groups like Makonto uh these are uh, sort of GDR was sending regular shipments of guns and ammunition in order to help with the armed struggle, not at the same level as say Yugoslavia or Cuba, but uh, the GDR was definitely a player there. Uh, and guns are and weaponry in general is a really important source of hard currency. There's very little concern also for where guns are resold to. So in this way, this proliferation of guns at a secondary market that are resold by states or sold to is also important at the time. Uh, in East Germany, they were making AK-47 knockoffs and license from the Soviet Union, but they actually developed their own assault rifle that was supposed to become a competitor internationally on the market. Uh, called the Viga that was developed in a town in uh, Saxony. Um, it's pictured here at the bottom. There's an arms museum in Zul where it was produced, which has exhibits of all these different things on hand. So in this way, also trying to use German technological development to create markets is not just for high-end, uh, not just for electronics and high-end manufactured goods in general, but also in the illicit arms trade. Um, by the 1980s, there's really a breakdown in a lot of the Cold War logic, and particularly with the Iran-Iraq War, where both Germanys are supplying both sides of the conflict in spite of international embargoes and uh, both countries claiming that they are trying to support peaceful solutions. So East Germany primarily supplies Iraq with arms, and or small arms, Iran with spare parts, because they keep capturing Soviet weapons from the Iraqis and need ways that they can fix them up again. The West Germans provide Iraq with chemical weapons. So the main chemical weapons attack that were done by the Iraqis are actually with German chemical precursors, which led to a major scandal. Um, and they provide small arms to Iran at the same time. And again, this question of using subsidiaries, using global networks, Iraq gets armored vehicles from Klub, but through a subsidiary in Brazil. So in this way that the expansion of German firms into other countries allows them to evade sanctions regimes, which would also occur in the case of South Africa with a wide variety of products. So if I look at the GDR, you can see this breakdown in the Cold War logic in the 1980s when it becomes really desperate for hard currency. Uh, the Stasi department in charge of trying to gain as much foreign currency as possible, COCO, they create a corporation called IMIS, which becomes the main arms export entity in 1982. Uh, there's actually deals made with apartheid South Africa through a number of intermediaries even. And by the 1980s, really, the GDR is just trying to find any markets it can. Um, and in 89, the discovery of these arms depots is actually an important part of the peaceful revolution as activists basically take control of these depots and use this as evidence that the sort of the peace loving socialist state of the GDR has something really rotten at its heart. Ironically, the guns that were discovered are then sold to South Africa in the 1990s as part of the disposal of GDR military surplus and as part of the South African government trying to uh, reform its military with the end of apartheid. Uh, so finally, to sort of conclude and to look at the post-Cold War period, um, with the reunification of Germany, the 1961 um, arms control or sorry, military export law is relevant for both countries again. 
And this is really developed and enhanced by the Arms Trade Treaty. It's an international multilateral agreement, 2013, several EU directives. But in the last 20 years or so, Germany has continued to be hit with these scandals of German arms companies, which are found to have been trading uh, without proper regard to export certificates or that people they're selling to them to are then uh, reselling weapons onto criminal gangs or that they're ending up in the hands of authoritarian regimes, which are using them for internal repression or external violence. Uh, in 2019, the law was tightened through a new uh, set of political regulations to try to really cut back on small arms scales, uh, sales, which, with the irony that this resulted in the peak level of German exports in 2019 as people were trying to get in before the end of the Merkel era and before these new regulations were put into place. Um, and just in the last two years alone, some of these headlines here, uh, you have Heckler and Koch was in trouble for its uh, weapons being used by criminal gangs and also by police in connection with the execu mass execution of students in Mexico. Sig Sauer, which is an Austrian company, but the guns it was producing in Germany ended up in Colombia. And then also you have pistols made by the Walter Corporation ended up in Colombia as well and uh, being used by multiple sides in the ongoing civil war there. So some conclusions of looking at this longer history that the German illicit arms trade has historically been tied up in national foreign policy and geopolitical concerns. It's impossible to disentangle it from the legal market as the actors and um, customers and lines of communication and trade are so interconnected. It's been marked, however, by varying waves of state coordination with private interests as the state is able to make the uh, arms industry into um, a wing of its own diplomatic initiatives and at times when the arms industry is essentially in free for, uh, free for all doing whatever it feels like and the German state is playing catch up trying to bring them in line. Um, now illicit arms markets around the world have generated dynamics which have created a lot of opportunities for global expansion both for the German state initially as a colonial power and then later as an international business power. Sorry, but it's also created a lot of pitfalls that had to be, and at times the illicit arms trade has had to be curtailed by the state in the name of pursuing broader foreign policy goals, either to avoid um, upsetting other colonial powers, avoid upsetting uh, allied nations, to avoid making countries think that Germany is invading them, like in the case of Venezuela, or in recent years to maintain Germany's standing as a good European nation that doesn't contribute to global conflict. Um, and the debates over reselling uh, arms in Ukraine and Germany providing uh, permission for countries they've already sold weapons to to be then resold to Ukraine itself is part of a long legacy of domestic concerns over arms supplies going to conflict zones and also influenced by Germany having been policed by other countries for its ties to the illicit arms trade for more than a century. Well, thank you very much.